Cram. Today I want to talk to you about a brand new medication that has now been FDA approved for a very common disease in the United States called COPD. That's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a disease that I see often as a pulmonologist. COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is a disease that causes the alveoli or the small air sacs in your lungs to get bigger. And as a result of that, it reduces the surface area that allows the oxygen to diffuse into your bloodstream. And so it can cause issues there. The other thing that it can do, as you can see here with the healthy picture at the top, the bronchioles are much larger and it allows the air to come out of your lungs. Whereas you can see here in COPD, the airways become compressed, they become smaller and even filled with mucus as well. So COPD is a range of specific diseases, emphysema, chronic bronchitis. Technically, it also includes asthma and bronchiectasis, depending on how you define it. But these are the major things. Number one is you have airway obstruction. And number two, you have decreased surface area. And number three, you have secretions. Now, part of that is inflammation. And today we're going to talk about how this can actually be alleviated through a new medication that's just been FDA approved. We haven't had a new medication in the management of COPD in over a decade. So the definition of COPD is a FEV1 divided by FEC of less than 0.7. Let me unpack that for you. So there is something called spirometry, which is part of a pulmonary function test. And during that procedure, you're asked to take a deep breath in and then to blow it out as hard as you possibly can. All of the air that comes out in an unlimited amount of time is known as the forced vital capacity. That's all of the air that you can blow out. And at the same time, what they're doing is they're measuring how much air you can blow out in one second. That's what that little one means here on the FEV1. The question is, is can you blow out 70% of the air that you can completely blow out in the first second? And if the answer is yes, or you can blow more than 70%, then you don't have COPD. On the other hand, if you are so obstructed that you cannot blow more than 70% of the air in your lungs out in the first second, then you have COPD by definition, and we can classify how severe that COPD is based on the percent predicted of that FEV1 for your type of lung size. So if it's between 80 and 100% of predicted, it's stage one. If it's 50 to 79% of predicted, it's stage two. If it's 30 to 49% of predicted, it's stage three. And then finally, if it's less than 30%, it's stage four. And so we call this mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. And as you can imagine, the treatment for this type of thing is to take the bronchial, which is small, and to make it larger. That's one of the major ways that we can get air out faster. Something that's key to this is understanding that in the wall of the bronchi are little filaments of smooth muscle. And when those smooth muscles contract, it gets smaller like this. And so really what we want to do is we want to have relaxation. By the way, this is exactly the same situation that we see in asthma, except in asthma, it's reversible, completely reversible. Whereas with COPD, we don't see that reversibility. We see permanent destruction, but there is still the ability to relax these fibers enough so that we can get it back to that nice and open state. And so there's a number of inhalers that we look at, and specifically in COPD, the first inhaler that we would put on is something called a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. That's because muscarinic receptors on the smooth muscle will cause the smooth muscle to contract, and so we want to block those. So those are long-acting muscarinic antagonists. But there's also beta receptors on those smooth muscle cells, and the long-acting beta agonists are going to excite those receptors and, again, cause relaxation. Finally, we can sometimes use inhaled corticosteroids, which reduce inflammation. But those are the last ones that we would put on a patient with COPD, as opposed to generally going in the other direction for asthma, where we tend to start patients on inhaled corticosteroids and LABAs first, and then add LAMAs last. And for more information, if you want to learn more about COPD or just about any disease like asthma, congestive heart failure, kidney disease, liver disease, we have videos on medcram.com that also get CME accreditation. You can learn more about this at our website, medcram.com. Let's talk about this new medication that's come out called ensafentrine, and it's a nebulized medication that patients take twice a day, three milligrams twice a day the FDA approval was based on a couple of randomized placebo-controlled trials. 
But first, let's talk about the mechanism, how enzofentrine works, because it works through a different mechanism than what we just talked about in terms of these inhalers. So there's two areas that are affected here by enzofentrine. There are the bronchial smooth muscle walls, and there are inflammatory cells. Let's talk about the bronchial smooth muscle cells first. Inside is a second messenger system that is able to transmit the binding of chemicals on the outside of the surface of the cell and cause changes on the inside. A major enzyme that is involved with this is something called adenylcyclase. And what this enzyme AC does is it takes something called adenosyl monophosphate, or AMP, and it converts it into something called cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is a second messenger that affects change on the inside of the cell. And what it does when it goes up in concentration, it actually can affect the contraction of the smooth muscle cells. And in fact, what it does is it blocks it. What we want to have is high levels of cyclic AMP. If there's an enzyme to make cyclic AMP, there's also an enzyme to break it down. And that's something called phosphodiesterase 3. Phosphodiesterase 3 causes cyclic AMP levels to drop, and that can cause contraction. If we take the medication ensofentrine, what actually happens here is that ensofentrine goes into these cells and it blocks phosphodiesterase inhibitor 3. And so what that does is it tends to increase the levels of cyclic AMP and therefore prevents contraction of smooth muscles. So what you have here is you have a bronchus, which is going to become larger. And what that's going to do is it's going to increase your FEV1. That's the first effect that ensofentrine does. What does it do in terms of inflammatory cells? So again, we have AC in these inflammatory cells. And they take AMP once again and convert it into cyclic AMP. In this case, though, cyclic AMP causes inflammation. And it does it because it increases the time of survival of these inflammatory cells, and it causes the increase in the production of things that cause inflammation. Ensofentrine is going to hit not only the PDE3 inhibitor in our bronchial cells, but also the PDE4 inhibitor. And as a result, because we know that PDE4 causes the prevention and breakdown from cyclic AMP to cyclic AMP, what we see here is that ensofentrine is going to block PDE4. And as a result of that, it's going to increase the concentration of cyclic AMP, which is going to block production of inflammation. And so actually what we have here in this situation is we have a reduction in inflammation. Just to do this again. In the bronchial smooth muscle cells, there is an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 3, and in the inflammatory cells, there is an enzyme called phosphodiesterase 4. Both of these enzymes are responsible for breaking down cyclic AMP, but we want cyclic AMP in both of those cells. And so what we do is we inhibit both of those enzymes that break down cyclic AMP, and as a result, we have an increase in both those types of cells, and both of those types of cells, cyclic AMP is going to respectively reduce contraction and it's also going to reduce inflammation. So what we get is an increase in FEV1 and a reduction in inflammation. That's what happens at the cellular level. Let's see how that actually translates into randomized placebo-controlled trials. Two randomized controlled trials, one was ENHANCE-1, ENHANCE-2. There were about 700 patients in both of those. And what they found in terms of endpoints and what they were looking for in the endpoint was the change in FEV1, as we've already talked about. If we look at these patients, many of them, the majority in fact, were already on LAMAs and LABAs, as we've already talked about, are beneficial. So this is good add-on therapy. What they found was that there was an 87 milliliter improvement in Enhance 1 and a 94 milliliter improvement in Enhance 2. This is not only statistically significant, it's also clinically meaningful. Remember, this was on top of LAMAs and LABAs as well. Because we showed that it could reduce inflammation, a good question would be whether or not it was able to reduce acute exacerbations of chronic bronchitis that often get people into the hospital. And those 28-day mortalities for that type of a diagnosis are on par with people being admitted to the hospital for an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Well, the good news is, is that it was statistically significant in reducing the exacerbation rate of COPD was also able to increase the time to the first exacerbation. 
and improve quality of life in Enhance 1. But interestingly, in Enhance 2, there was a lot of dropouts in the placebo group. So in other words, when you put this on people, we don't know, and they don't know whether they're getting the drug or not. And so if they're getting side effects, if they're feeling bad, if they're not breathing, people on placebo may drop some of these medications, specifically the trial medication. And if it's actually doing some work, if it's actually doing good and reducing the exacerbations and reducing these side effects, you might expect that people in the placebo group might drop out thinking that they're on the medication when they're really not. And that's exactly what happened here. There was actually a higher dropout rate in the placebo group. And that might have been the reason why there was no statistical significance in the Enhance 2 trial. In terms of adverse events, it was about the same. It was in Enhance 1, it was 40.3% in the placebo, slightly higher in the intervention group at 463 but it was almost identical. In fact, maybe a little bit higher in the placebo group in Enhance 2. In terms of serious adverse events, you can see them listed here, pneumonia, GI side effects, cardiovascular events, similar to placebo, and again, similar to placebo. In terms of treatment withdrawal, as we said before, 24% in the intervention group and 32% in the placebo group. It's not unusual to see higher dropout rates in the placebo group, especially if the drug is actually doing what it's supposed to do. And then in Enhance 2, there seemed to be an increase as well in that placebo group. Tolerability, generally speaking, was well tolerated and a greater than 90% adherence. So this is now available. I don't know how available it's actually going to be in terms of coverage from insurance companies. It is pretty expensive, about $3,000 wholesale. Hopefully the insurance will actually cover this medication, but it does seem to offer some improvements in quality of life, also improvement in breathing. One thing that I want to mention is that the people that it was used on had FEV1% predicted in the 30 to 70 range. That's typically the type of patient you're going to want to use that in. It's a pretty broad range. As we talked about before, this would be people who are in the moderate and all the people that were in the severe group, but not the mild group. Now, that's important to understand because back in 2011, we had the FDA approval of Rifimulast, which was also a PDE4 inhibitor, and it did reduce exacerbations as well. However, that one was FDA approved in people who had less than 50% predicted FEV1 and had had an exacerbation in the last 12 months. This here is a little bit different than that in that it's a little bit wider of a inclusion group, so not just less than 50%, but less than 70% down to 30%. And there is no requirement to have had an exacerbation in the last 12 months. I have no financial connection with this medication or the manufacturer in any way, shape, or form. This is actually also being looked at, by the way, in patients with bronchiectasis. I hope this has been helpful. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and join us at medcram.com.